any child or adult listening to this, if you're waking up with a dry mouth in the morning, you're not likely to wake up feeling refreshed. You're more likely to be snoring. You're more likely to have insomnia. Mouth breathing is causing upper chest breathing. Mouth breathing can also affect and reduce oxygen transfer from the lungs to the blood and the blood to the tissues and organs. Mouth breathing increases the risk of obstructive sleep apnea. None of this is new. And there are some wonderful individuals in Australia who know all of this. If you look at um, Dr. Derek Mahoney, he's based in Randwick, and he has a team of ear, nose and throat doctors and orthodontists around them. They will all understand the importance of nasal breathing. So there are some select ENTs who understand it. There's Dr. James Bartley from New Zealand, who has written about the importance of nasal breathing for at least 20 years. But just such a simple advice. And people might be wondering, well, you know, is it not natural to breathe with your mouth open? It's absolutely not natural to breathe with your mouth open. Your mouth is a hole. That's all it is. And it's a hole whereby you can take air directly down your throat. Your mouth does nothing. Far let air in. Your nose does all of the work. And it's the only organ in the human body that serves any purpose in terms of breathing. Welcome to Wellness Spring, our one-stop shop for education, inspiration, motivation, and optimal wellness. Learn from top experts and exceptional people. Hi Patrick, welcome back to Wellness Spring. It's so lovely to see you again. Good to be here. Thanks very much, Beverly. Dear listeners, today we're speaking with Patrick McEwen, who's the foremost leading authority on nasal breathing exercises for sleep and performance. And I'm keen to know, Patrick, have you ever heard of the barefoot investor, Scott Pape? Um, I haven't heard of him, no. Okay, so Scott Pape is the number one bestseller and the only money guide you'll ever need to get your finances sorted over garlic bread and a glass of wine. And his first tip is to have investment in a very good pillow to ensure a good night's sleep. So I'm wondering what your thoughts are on that. Yeah, I totally agree. I, I think it's absolutely instrumental and it has been overlooked. But really one has to define what is a good night's sleep? How do you achieve a good night's sleep? And if you read 10 books on sleep out there at the moment, one of, they're all missing pretty much the vital ingredient. Right, because over the years I've been told by various um, doctors, you know, some of them will say no, no pillow. And some of them will say, have an orthopedic pillow and some of them will say one pillow only so I was just going to check with you you know is there a, a best for way or best pillow for optimal breathing and optimal sleep it's the main thing is to make sure that the airway is as wide as it can be so you want to avoid head tilt and it's even been shown if you're if one is doing scans of the airway the position of your head will influence the size of your airway. So the pillow has to be in a way that it avoids head tilt. You don't want your head back. You don't want your head forward. You don't want your head to one side or to the other. You want your head directly in line with the spine. But most importantly, that all of these individuals are forgetting is the importance of nose breathing, Beverly. You know, and I'm not just saying it because this is my space. It's completely overlooked and it's the elephant in the room. You can have the best pillow in the world. And if you sleep with your mouth open, you're still likely to have a poor night's sleep. Right. Because I was also, because people have been asking me, oh, because he promotes a good night's sleep, you know, ask him as well about, um, does he give tips on mattresses? Um, For me, for example, I'm a slim build and my partner's heavier. I prefer something more medium. He prefers something more soft. So I like... The idea when you go to the hotels, 
um, having two beds, push them together. And we have that at home as well. So we both have that. What's your thoughts on mattresses? <laughs> I, um, that, that I don't know where. That's an intro. I like a hard mattress, but that's just me. Yeah. You know, okay. I suppose this is going to be an individual thing. What's the mattress that's going to assist with you waking up the best, you know, in the best frame of mind in feeling energized, having uninterrupted sleep and not snoring and not having obstructive sleep apnea and not having insomnia. So that's really the question that we should be asking overall. Um, you know, and those are the topics. And if a mattress assists with that, great. If a pillow assists with that, great. But still, um, I'm going to bring it back to breathing. Yeah. And you mentioned that um, babies are naturally born in our last chat with nose breathing. So I was just wondering when they often change to mouth breathing or, you know, do people just form this habit while they're a baby? Because, and do men and women um, change from nose breathing to mouth breathing at different stages? Because I don't know about you, but my partner sleeps with his arms above his head and my niece said her partner does and her two baby sons sleep like that. And all the ladies I've asked, they don't sleep like that. And obviously you're talking about nasal breathing, but it also involves the diaphragm. You know, does it matter whether we sleep on our back or side? So this is all to do with the best optimal um, position to, for sleeping and nasal breathing, which I was going to come to. Yeah, sleeping position is interesting. Uh, myofunctional therapists will say to sleep in the back. Different healthcare providers will say sleep in the back. But yes, we know that people with sleep apnea, their apnea is double. 50% wow. of 50 of people with sleep apnea, they have double, double the severity of sleep apnea if they sleep in the back. So really, we have to consider that when we are sleeping on the back, that the lower jaw is falling inwards, the tongue is falling into the airway, and any obstruction of the airway can cause collapse of the airway, either a partial collapse, which would be a hypopnea, or a complete collapse, which is an apnea. And the issue there is that if we have a reduction in the flow of our breathing, that we're not taking as much air into our lungs, or if we have complete stopping of the breath, it disturbs blood gases. Oxygen cannot get into the body. Carbon dioxide cannot leave the body. And this will cause the brain to arouse you from sleep because, of course, the brain is here to protect the body. So at some point, if you've stopped breathing during sleep, the brain has to waken you up partially. So you're aroused from the deep sleep. But the problem here is that individuals who could be having 30 of these events per hour, this is not something that might happen just once or twice. Yes, of course it can, but it can happen 50 times an hour. So you will have individuals and also with children um, obstructive sleep apnea affects about two to three percent of the childhood population and sleep disorder breathing affects about 15 percent of the childhood population obstructive sleep apnea affects more men than women so it's about 30 percent of the male population and it's about nine percent from one study anyway of females up to 50 years of age and 27 percent from females 50 years of age plus so post menopause so you know and coming back then so Obstructive sleep apnea, snoring and sleep disorder, breathing, it, it wreaks havoc. And your quotation about the first pillar of health is about sleep. I totally agree with it. I don't think we will have good mental health. We won't have focus. We won't have concentration. We are not productive. Our mood is likely to be impacted. And even athletes who are sleepy are more likely to be injured because their reaction times are going to be slower. So you know like if you think of the pressures on people to survive now and even the kid who's in in school and the university student the corporate worker the sports person military first responders etc sleep is vital and this has only came to fruition in the last 15 years or so despite it being discussed for the last 400 years so there's been really a lag now it's great to see that there is some progress there but um you know I'm going to come back to this, Beverly, 
Christian Guimano is a sleep doctor who's passed on in 2019, and he was the founding father, or at least considered to be one of the founding fathers of sleep medicine. He a French medical doctor based at Stanford University. He coined the phrase obstructive sleep apnea, and he developed the apnea hypopnea index, which is a measurement of apnea severity. I remember him back in Bordeaux in 2016. We were at a sleep congress. He was speaking there. He stood up in the middle of the room amongst all his peers and he told them that they are missing the elephant in the room. And that was the importance of nasal breathing during sleep. Now, this information hasn't trickled down and it's likely that this is going to take 20 years to trickle down. That's how long it takes for something to change because this, this is not going to make money for anybody. You know, mm. it, this is not going to be, if this was something that was, had the promise of millions of dollars of profit, you can imagine the number of people who would be jumping on the bandwagon. But just like breathing exercises, you know, you can, you can read a book for $15 and you can get pretty much everything in it. Um, it doesn't promise all that much money. And this is what has held it back. And this is a pity. Any child or adult listening to this, if you're waking up with a dry mouth in the morning, you're not likely to wake up feeling refreshed. You're more likely to be snoring. You're more likely to have insomnia. Mouth breathing is causing upper chest breathing. Mouth breathing can also affect and reduce oxygen transfer from the lungs to the blood and the blood to the tissues and organs. Mouth breathing increases the risk of obstructive sleep apnea. None of this is new. And there are some wonderful individuals in Australia who know all of this. If you look at um, Dr. Derek Mahoney, he's based in Randwick, and he has a team of ear, nose and throat doctors and orthodontists around them they will all understand the importance of nasal breathing. So there are some select ENTs who understand it. There's Dr. James Bartley from New Zealand, who has written about the importance of nasal breathing for at least 20 years, but just such a simple advice. And people might be wondering, well, you know, is it not natural to breathe with your mouth open? It's absolutely not natural to breathe with your mouth open. Your mouth is a hole, that's all it is. And it's a hole whereby you can take air directly down your throat your mouth does nothing, bar let air in. Your nose does all of the work and it's the only organ in the human body that serves any purpose in terms of breathing. Your, your first question in terms of infants, at what age do they switch from, from nose to mouth breathing? Anatomically, when we are born, we cannot physically breathe through the mouth. And I'm not sure if this is for 100% of infants, there may be some exceptions, but the soft palate, which is basically the soft tissue at the back of the roof of the mouth, that meets with the epiglottis. So the flap um, that's in the airway. And as a result, physically, the mouth for a young infant is only for eating and for maybe, you know, communicating, etc., drinking. The nose for the infant is only for breathing. Now, in, in, infants, though, who have an anatomically deficient nose, they often struggle. And unfortunately, it's implicated in sudden infant death syndrome. Because if their nasal airway is not sufficiently large enough to allow for easy breathing, the children cannot switch to mouth breathing because anatomically they're not able to. And they can die as a result of hypoxia in sleep. And this could be recognized in the first couple of, in the first couple of days of life. You know, because a child who is born with a high narrow palate is likely to have a compromised nasal airway. And these children can be at risk of sudden infant death syndrome. This could be checked in the hospital. It's not. Children, if they're tongue-tied, could be checked in the hospital. In most instances, it's not. The importance of breastfeeding is not always communicated to the mother, not just in terms of nutrition, but in terms of when the baby is, is feeding from the mother, it manipulates the muscles of the face necessary for craniofacial growth. So breastfeeding helps the development of the face and airways. That's not communicated, you know? So I know, and I don't want to put any blame on mothers whatsoever, but the health authorities have been asleep in this instance. It's really time for them to wake up. Wow, well, and what about mothers listening or fathers? How can they detect if the baby's got um, problems with their palate? Yeah, it's just even look up into the palate. Now, I know the best thing to do is really is to get a healthcare specialist who is aware of this. 
myofunctional therapists are trained in this field. Um, Derek Mahoney, for example, in, in Sydney is trained. There's many others. There's also the author of a book called Sleep Wrecked Kids. And uh, she's, uh, her, unfortunately, her name doesn't come to mind. Mm -hmm. So she won't be impressed with that. But her book is Sleep Wrecked Kids. Read her book, you know, because a speech and language pathologists are often trained in this. So I think it really depends on the modalities. But the child shouldn't have, when you look up into a child's mouth, you shouldn't see a very high palate. It shouldn't be vaulted. Right. Because if you see a vaulted palate, you have to ask, well, if the, if the roof of the mouth is so high, where is the space encroaching? And it's encroaching on the nose. Look at the size of the baby's nostrils. And do you notice that the baby is struggling to breathe through the nose? And also look at the color of the palate. And I haven't observed this myself, but I was told it by different individuals in the field that if the palate is very high, the palate can be a kind of a purplish color which would indicate that there's reduced blood flow and oxygen um, oxygenation. So yeah, just things to be watching out for, but it's really best if you're, if you're a parent in doubt and your child is stopping breathing during sleep, or even if you can hear, if you can hear your child breathing during sleep, it's not good. We shouldn't even hear a child breathing during sleep. So when you think of an adult male and he's in a room and he's snoring his head off, that's a totally different story to a child because even when it comes to obstructive sleep apnea, it's only clinically significant for an adult when they have five events per hour, but for a child, if they have more than one events per hour, it's significant. So a child cannot have the severity of sleep, sleep disorder breathing that an adult has. It means that even if they're snoring, it's a problem. Wow. Yeah. I can't think of anything worse than to lose a baby suddenly like that. The shock for the family, not only the parents, oh, but the extended family, and over something that um, could be easily educated and brought to mm. everyone's attention. Yes, and fixed. Yeah. And, you know, this is, this is the wake-up call. And unfortunately, the parents who have to go through this trauma, and I can only imagine it too, and anybody who's listening, you know, but where again, like what is going on here? I'm in this field 20 years yeah. and I learned of the importance of nasal breathing for craniofacial development about 11 or 12 years ago. I didn't know it up until then, but just myself as a lay person looking in, it just made total sense. And I was the kid in school with difficulty concentrating yeah. in high school. I left school at 14 years of age, never to go back. And that was the sense of frustration that I had in school. I struggled with academia. And, you know, it wasn't because I'm not intelligent. And, you know, it, like the problem is, though, if you're struggling with academia and you don't do well in exams, you're judged as being lesser intelligent. So they, these kids can be highly intelligent kids, but they have no sleep. Their sleep quality is dreadful. I was snoring. I was told in the university I was stopping breathing during sleep. So I have a sense of frustration here. I really feel it. And, you know, it's just unfortunate, you know, that, um, that the awareness is not out there. I feel that when healthcare professionals get trained, they go into their own little box and they stay in it and they don't look outside their box except, except for innovators. And there are some innovators. There are some wonderful healthcare professionals who understand about this. And they, they do get it out there, but they are limited. It's not taught in the universities. Like, what are the individuals doing in the teaching universities? All those professors, you know, those beautiful institutions. And yet it's almost that they are teaching a system of, that's archaic, that's so far behind in the times. And ultimately, their failure to educate new dentists and medical doctors is leading to fatalities. Yeah, it's heartbreaking. And um, yeah, going back to the children, what are your thoughts on children and adults sleeping with their um, head under the blankets? I haven't given it a whole lot of thought. Um, it wouldn't diminish oxygen. It may pool carbon dioxide slightly. Right. It really will depend on the blanket you know, and the fibers of the blanket, 
no no even not even the mattress nothing should be man-made fibers everything including the mattress should be natural fibers sheets cotton all breathable and i think that's really the more important question um now you know children have different ways of sleeping i remember with my own infant she did have a tendency to sleep in her sides even though the natural advice from you know from the hospital was to have the, the infant sleep on their back and we let the child sleep on our side and she slept comfortably on her side and that, that's fine you know and then she sometimes would sleep on her front with her her bum and up in the air and her knees as, as young infants sleep and I found that was absolutely fine as well so I suppose it's a decision that you make considering all things but the one thing that we did do was there was no mattress coming into the house that had any man-made fibers because that is a problem if a child can't breathe through the mattress. Okay, that's great tips there because since the last talk, lots of mothers have been approaching me with questions and um, maybe now would be a good time if you could please explain the fundamentals of the oxygen advantage and also the Bateo method. Uh, Fundamentals are the importance of nose breathing in and out through the nose, both during rest, during sleep and during physical exercise with the tongue elevated into the palate. So the tongue resting against the palate, because when the tongue is resting against the palate, which is the roof of the mouth, it helps to open out the airway. And this is important for sleep. And also for young developing children, when the tongue is resting against the palate, the pressures exerted by the tongue will help to, to ensure the forward growth of the face. So the tongue is very powerful for, the, for its size. It's considered to be the most powerful muscle for its size in the human body. And it's the pressures exerted by the palate, by the tongue against the palate, which is developing the shape of the top jaw. Ideally, we want forward growth of the jaw. You don't want jaws like mine that are set back. You don't want a double chin and a double chin is not necessarily that the individual has put on weight, but it's a sign that the lower jaw is set back. And when the lower jaw is set back, the airway is compromised. I have a very narrow airway as a result. I have a high palate as a result of chronic mouth breathing. Now one could say, was it, was it the high palate that caused the mouth breathing or was it the mouth breathing that caused the high palate? It's likely both. So you can have infants who have been tum sucking even in the womb, which is interesting. And tum sucking, when the baby is sucking their tum, the pressure exerted by the tum, which is very narrow, can influence the development of the top jaw. So, you know, just habits that we, that kids kind of develop and, you know, it's, it's but at the same time, whether it's a chicken or an egg scenario, it's possible to do something about it. And this is another, this is where orthodontics needs to come in as well in recognition of the importance of nose breathing with the tongue against the roof of the mouth. And also for orthodontics to realize that it's not just about straightening teeth. Children who have crooked teeth, why are the teeth crooked? The teeth are crooked because there's not enough room for the teeth in the jaw. So the top jaw, the maxilla is too small and the top jaw is too small. What does that say then? whether there's enough room for the tongue. We need straight teeth because straight teeth indicate that the jaws have developed the way they should have developed. Mm -hmm. And when the jaws have developed the way they should develop, the airway is going to be better because there's plenty of room for the tongue and the roof of the mouth. I don't have enough room for, for my tongue in my mouth, even though I've had my jaws widened and I had that done at 40 years of age. I used to travel over to Agora Hills in California to a dentist, an orthodontist called Dr. William Hang. And for anybody, if you were looking for, say, information on the importance of nose breathing, his website is face focused. And that's not a plug. That's just a source of information. But coming back to Uteco and oxygen advantage, the importance of breathing starts with breathing in and out through the nose. But there's also three dimensions to breathing. There's breathing to have normal biochemistry. And what I mean by that is normal carbon dioxide in the blood. The carbon dioxide is not just a waste gas that people talk about. It plays a number of, a number of roles. For an example, it's very common for people who have dysfunctional breathing patterns or 
poor, poor quality breathing, that they have cold hands and cold feet. And cold hands and cold feet implies that blood vessels are constricted or narrowed. So poor circulation is influenced by how hard you breathe. And what I mean by that is the heaviness of your breathing is influenced by the speed of your breathing multiplied by the size of each breath. It's not just looking at the speed of your breathing. It's not just enough to count the number of breaths per minute. We have to also consider tidal volume. Really what we're considering is minute ventilation. Now there's a certain amount of air that we should be breathing per minute. Not too much, but not too little, just right. It's quite common for people to overbreed. And this can be influenced by genetics. This is influenced by hormones with, with females. Um, this is also influenced by different lifestyle factors. So for example, people who talk for a living, talking is not good for your breathing. And people who talk for a living will often know that they're quite tired at the end of the day. Food can impact our breathing. Lack of exercise can impact our breathing. I think that one of the biggest ones for the adult population is stress or trauma. And even as such as even childhood anxiety or childhood separation, that that can change breathing patterns. And breathing can change that one becomes overly sensitive to the accumulation of the gas carbon dioxide in the blood. Now, what that means is that carbon dioxide is the stimulus to breathe. Every breath that you take is triggered by carbon dioxide increasing in the blood. And the brain reacts by sending a message to breathe. The brain sends a message to the diaphragm breathing muscle, which is located just at the base of your lungs. And the diaphragm breathing muscle moves down by about one to two centimeters during rest. And the intercostal muscles, which are the muscles in between the ribs, pull out. So this increases the volume of your chest. And as a result, you take an inhalation. However, if you're overly sensitive to the accumulation of carbon dioxide, the triggers, the messaging coming from the brain is going to be quite strong. And I know I'm using very kind of layman terms here just to keep it simple. Yeah. This will result in faster and harder breathing. So if, for example, one way, I suppose, to get an idea of your own breathing patterns is to sit next to your colleague and hopefully your colleague's breathing is pretty mm -hmm. decent mm -hmm. and compare how hard and fast you breathe relative to your colleague. Now, your colleague could be a top athlete, but it doesn't necessarily imply that they've got good breathing. We work with um, world-class athletes. Some of our instructors are working with, you know, literally world-leading athletes, and they can have poor breathing patterns. Because athletes, of course, are prone to perfectionist tendencies. They're prone to their own stresses, genetic influences, etc. And physical training does not always improve breathing. But if you can improve your breathing, you can improve your athletic performance. So, so yeah, so breathing is about looking at the biochemistry of the breath, but it's also about looking at the biomechanics. And this is implying good amplitude of the diaphragm. Your diaphragm breathing muscle separates your chest from your abdomen. And every breath that you take, the diaphragm is moving. And as the diaphragm is moving, it provides stabilization for the spine. So for example, 50% of people with lower back pain have dysfunctional breathing. Now, is it the lower back pain which causes dysfunctional breathing or is it dysfunctional breathing which can be recognized by breathing a little bit faster in upper chest? Is that what's contributing to lower back pain? And it could be both, but let's fix dysfunctional breathing. There's another connection between the diaphragm breathing muscle and the gastrointestinal tract and also in lymphatic drainage because every time you breathe, you've got the diaphragm, it's almost it's massaging the internal organs. And it's assisting in lymphatic drainage. So the lymph system is like the body sewage, sewage system and getting rid of waste from the human body. And it doesn't have a pump of its own. So it can rely on the, the actions of the diaphragm, the movement of the diaphragm to get rid of waste from the body. The diaphragm breathing muscle is also connected with the emotions. And when we breathe low and, you know, you could use the word deep, but the problem with the word deep is that people often misinterpret it because they think a deep breath is a big, big breath. It's not. A deep breath just implies that as you breathe in, your lower ribs move outwards. So basically, as the diaphragm moves downwards, we have movement to the sides, we have movement to the front, and we have movement to the back. But if you go into different studios, and we did a survey on this, and sometimes people give out to me when I talk about it, and there were yoga studios. We looked at 10 and we asked, how is breathing being taught in these 
studios. In seven out of 10, the yoga instructor was contributing to overbreathing in the students. And the yoga instructor was telling the students to take these full big breaths. You could hear the students inside in the studio all breathing. Almost that it was on the back of the idea that the more air you breathe, the better. And the problem with that is that if you breathe too much air, you get rid of too much carbon dioxide from the blood through the lungs. This causes your blood vessels to constrict. But not only that, when we breathe, oxygen transfers from the lungs into the blood. And 98.5% of oxygen in the blood is carried by a protein called hemoglobin. So hemoglobin is a protein in the red blood cells and it carries oxygen. Hemoglobin releases oxygen in the presence of carbon dioxide. This is called the Bohr effect. But if we are breathing too hard, we get rid of too much carbon dioxide from the blood. And as a result, hemoglobin holds onto oxygen and doesn't deliver it. So it's not only our oxygen uptake, it's not only the blood circulation, but it's also oxygen delivery to tissues and organs, which is influenced by how hard we breathe. So I think it's, you know, the best way to understand this is to practice it. Maybe you have been taking intentionally full big breaths over a period of time. Now start doing the opposite and have a mantra that your breathing should be no slow and low, but you should never hear your breathing during rest. If you do your yoga practice, do it with light breathing and actually slow down your breathing to the point that you have a, a light air hunger. A light air hunger or a need for air will imply that carbon dioxide is increased in the blood because we said that carbon dioxide is the primary stimulus to breathe. Can you imagine the potential of this in yoga? Can you imagine the thousands and hundreds of thousands and millions of people practicing yoga that would go into a yoga studio, those individuals with asthma and respiratory issues, sleep issues, insomnia, snoring, sleep apnea, panic disorder, anxiety, depression, and can you imagine that the yoga instructor is able to not just bring them to the different postures, but to change their breathing from a biochemical point of view, to improve blood flow and oxygen delivery throughout the body, from a biomechanical point of view, to harness optimal movement of the diaphragm, but also to bring in resonance frequency breathing or coherent breathing, to slow down the breath to six breaths per minute for different postures, because this will help to strengthen the bar reflex and will help to balance the autonomic nervous system. And that's what we do in Oxygen Advantage. Buteco is, is a wonderful modality and its focus is very much on the biochemistry. And for me, it was life changing. It was the best thing that I had ever came across. It completely changed my life. I was lucky enough, I came across it when I was about 26 or 27 years of age and, or even less, 25 years of age, I can't remember now. But I remember because I was a chronic mouth breather, waking up exhausted in the mornings, having to get up to go to the bathroom during the middle of the night once or twice, which is not good either. Even if you're in your 20s or 30s or 40s, regardless of age, you should be able to sleep uninterrupted. Because if you need to go, get up to go to the bathroom, your sleep is disrupted and you're more likely to be tired. But I remember putting it into practice and decongesting my nose by simply breathing in and out through my nose, holding my nose and nodding my head up and down. And I was able to open up my nose. Now, granted, it just, it just does it temporarily, but the more you breathe through your nose and the more you practice the exercises and the other exercises, your nose opens up. And I had an operation on my nose in 1994, but nobody told me to breathe through it afterwards. And again, that's an issue. Like I receive emails from individuals all of the time, people who have read the books. And like one email that came in this morning was a lieutenant in the, in the US Marines. He has been mouth breathing for years and I can't remember what age he is, so that's completely off the top of my head. But he told me the number of times our years he's been mouth breathing, he has had an operation on the nose. And he said simply the advice and switching to nose breathing was life changing. His breath whole time, his bolt score from the oxygen advantage was 12 seconds. Well, he thought it was 16, but he thinks it's 12. He's not totally sure. So, you know, any time that your breath hold time as an adult is less than 25 seconds, it implies dysfunctional breathing. And we've been using the score of 20 seconds for 20 years, but there was a study that came out in 2018 by Professor Kyle Kiesel, who's a professor of physical therapy. 
and he looked at 51 individuals. They were 27 years of age on average. And he looked at their breathing from a biochemical point of view, a biomechanical point of view, and a psychophysiological point of view. And his conclusion was that if your comfortable breath hold time is above 25 seconds, there is an 89% chance that dysfunctional breathing is not present. Now, if we were to measure 100 people and have them sitting down, resting for five minutes with normal breathing, as you should be, and then ask them to breathe in and out through your nose and pinch your nose and hold your breath, and we time it until you feel the first definite desire to breathe, I would pretty much guarantee that at least 60% will have a breath hold time of less than 25 seconds. That implies dysfunctional breathing. Now, what does that mean in everyday sense? Well, it means that if your breathing is dysfunctional, and I know dysfunctional might be the maybe suboptimal breathing, a room for improvement. But if your breathing has room for improvement during the day, it has room for improvement during sports. Because if you have a low breath hold time during the day, you're more likely to be disproportionately breathless during physical exercise, to gas out too soon, to have exercise intolerance, to be overly breathless during physical exercise, your sleep is likely to be impacted because your breathing is harder and faster during sleep. And this increases resistance to breathing. So this is going to contribute to snoring and obstructive sleep apnea, but also insomnia. Your mood is likely to be impacted because if you have a low breath hold time, you're more likely to be breathing a little bit faster in upper chest and faster in upper chest breathing will increase the stress response. So it increases sympathetic drive. So the stress response of the, of the body. And that's why it's very important to learn light, slow and low breathing or light, slow and deep. The LSD can be a good acronym there. And improving your breathing in order to influence the autonomic nervous system, but your overall health as well. So yeah, so that's what we do. What's the difference between Buteco and Oxygen Advantage? Buteco is very much health focused and it's under Buteco method. We have about 10 exercises. Oxygen Advantage encompasses health and sports. So I wanted to bring out a breathing modality for sports performance and now for corporate performance as well. And that's where the Oxygen Advantage comes in. Oxygen Advantage is more wide, it's more broader because I could bring in breathing exercises outside of the Buteco method. And, you know, I, this is another aspect. Breathing is often taught according to tradition. And my training was originally in the Buteco method. And I can make small tweaks, of course, with experience with the Buteco method, which I have in terms of what we teach. But I couldn't change it and add stuff that was so different. But I can with Oxygen Advantage. So Oxygen Advantage, we have 26 breathing exercises. So we just have a bigger toolbox. Um, so yeah, so that's the difference between the two modalities. There's some crossover, of course. Um, but there's quite some quite differences as well. And if someone was to come for um, a consultation with you, what would the person expect? Or is it all tailor-made? Just, uh, just for the listeners yes. to get an understanding of what happens, the type of work that you're doing. Like the first thing that we do is I'd always look at person's breathing and do it discreetly and just pick up on how are they breathing and we're paying attention to how fast is the person breathing? Are they breathing up her chest? Do they have regular breathing patterns? Are they nose breathing, mouth breathing, etc.? Is there breathing an effort? Uh, we look at the natural pause following exhalation. So we get a good sense of a person's breathing even just by observing it. And we can do that online. That's just with experience. We measure breath hold time. We give them some feedback. We make sure that they're measuring it correctly because sometimes people aren't sure where is the exact point to let go and a little bit subjective, but if we can get, get it within a couple of seconds, it gives us you know, that feedback. If we have an athlete, we can go much different. So we go through the functional breathing patterns, light, slow and deep breathing, three dimensions of breathing, but then <clears throat> we bring that into physical exercise, how to breathe when you go for a walk, how to breathe when you go for a run, we also use breath holding. So here we deliberately have the individual hold their breath during jogging, running, and sprinting. And we do that to lower blood oxygen saturation and to increase carbon dioxide. And this disturbs the blood acid-base balance. 
it forces the body to make adaptations to include the buffering capacity. And what this means is that when the individual then is doing physical exercise, the hydrogen ion coming from the tissues is buffered and we can delay lactic acid and fatigue. So from a performance point of view, we look at breathing with the oxygen advantage. Functional breathing is to get everyday breathing better, but we also have strategies then of how to apply in sports, in rugby, in soccer, in MMA, in different sports. And we have, you know, even during the week, working with, not this week, last week, premiership footballers, bringing them through their paces. And, you know, these are pros. And in general, we do see pretty good breathing. There are some exceptions. One individual at the moment we're working at, his bolt score, his breath hold time varies between 30 and 40 seconds. And strategies to how do you upregulate? If you're anxious before a game, how do you bring breathing exercise to help deal with pre-match anxiety? Post-physical exercise, how do you recover? So how do you get a better night's sleep before an event? How do you reduce your breathlessness during physical exercise? How do you improve your repeated sprintability? And just, it was an, a very interesting study that was conducted in Australia by Wurons in 2018. And he got 21 highly trained rugby union players. So these were during competitive season. I think they were 21 years of age on average. He divides them into two groups. One group, did breath hold training and the same protocols that we use. And the other group did their sprints with normal breathing. After four weeks, they measured repeated sprint ability. The group who did their sprints with breath holding increased their repeated sprint ability from, from nine reps to 14.8 reps before exhaustion. And the group who did their sprints with normal breathing had from nine to 10 reps. So it was a margin change in the group who did sprinting with normal breathing but the groups who were doing the 40 meter sprints and a breath hold and i know that might sound might sound pretty tough it is but these guys are well trained and here we have highly trained individuals pro athletes and normally if you can get a half or one percent improvement it's significant but to increase repeated sprintability from nine reps to 14.8 and repeated sprintability is a performance indicator in team sports. You know, so I think probably your one is asking, well, if it's so good, why hasn't it got out there? And that's a question that I've been asking for 20 years. And really it's about putting it into practice. But I will say this, Beverly, the last three years we have noticed a phenomenal growth and a growth that we cannot keep up with. And we have a minimum of a thousand instructors across 50 countries. And, you know, it's tremendous. It really is. And as one person said, it's taking 20 years to be an overnight success, but it's great to see breathing getting out there and it's high time. Oh yeah, absolutely. Like um, breath is vital for life without it, we're dead. And I've worked like yourself a lot with athletes and from what you're saying, that is, you know, big ch changes, you know, it's game changing, literally, you know, for them to improve their performance. But just yes. um, to want to change your health and like listening to you because I'm a registered nurse, it's like having an anatomy and physiology session because you're so well versed. And I was chatting with a colleague the other day and she said even though she did O-level, A-level biology, it was only when she did some naturopathy training and something else that she really learned about the body systems and what they do. So for me, I think this is the best education for late teenagers, early teenagers, adults, because these body, bodies come with us throughout life. And it's like, you need to take control of your life and, you know, to be able to change your life from that multitude of disease that you mentioned earlier that can be controlled just by simple nasal breathing exercises. So, yeah, fingers crossed. And just one quick one. There's a saying, if you don't use it, you lose it. Is that the same with the nose? Yes. 
and this has been shown. Um, I can't remember the exact study, but there were individuals who anatomically couldn't breathe through. I think they were fed via the throat and their nose become totally unusable. So it was a proof that if you weren't using your nose, that it, it gets progressively more obstructed or more difficult to breathe through it. I would fully agree with it, but the converse is true. If you continuously breathe through your nose, your, your nose works much better. And, you know, when people talk about a stuffy nose, oftentimes probably doesn't get that much attention. But if you have a stuffy nose, you are two to three times more likely to have moderate to severe sleep disorder breathing. Mm. People with a stuffy nose are more tired. And the implications for that, you know, if we think about childhood, and we were talking about young infants earlier on, there was a study by Karen Bollock published in Pediatrics Medical Journal in 2012. She looked at 11,000 British children and she looked at them over, a, I think it was a five or six year period. Children with snoring or sleep disorder breathing. So children with sleep disorder breathing at age five, if they were untreated, they had a 40% increased risk of special education needs by age eight. Now, wow. we have to think of the implications of this. Here's a window of three to four years. And if children are having sleep difficulties, it's causing brain damage. And that's literally what it is because the brain is developing in a young child in the very formative years. And in order for the brain to develop, the child must have deep sleep. And how many kids have issues related to sleep deprivation? And it's not just about the time that the child sleeps in bed. Like as a teenager, I could sleep for 10 hours. I could sleep for 12 hours. I would still wake up exhausted. So there's a whole different story between quality and quantity. And quality is not just about sleep hygiene. It does come back to functional breathing patterns, no slow and low. It's very important. Right. And because you mentioned families and children, and you mentioned genetics, did anybody else in your family have asthma, like your parents or siblings or grandparents? Or your daughter? Yes, my parents didn't. Right. My parents had wide facial structures. Uh -huh. So they never had asthma throughout their life. And broad faces and strong people. And we weren't, you know, because this is the change though in diets. From, all it takes is one generation. And my daughter is missing teeth. So she's got teutogenesis. And the problem with that is that it's not just that she's missing one, one tooth. It indicates that her jaws are too small. So we've been working with her with this since she's been four years of age in terms of developing the jaws. Mm. And, you know, the issue is like, of course, I'm aware of the impact of teutogenesis and sleep disorder breathing for the rest of one's life. But not every parent is because it just doesn't get talked about. But this is where the dental industry has been asleep. And why have dentists not been trained to recognize the risk factors for sleep issues in kids and adults? Like I'm 40, 48 years of age and I've been to a medical doctor once in 20 years. Now I could have sleep disorder breathing, but because I don't attend the medical doctor, it's not going to get recognized. Many men are going to be like me. So there's many, many men out there who haven't needed to visit their medical doctor. But yet they may have sleep apnea, but they don't know it. Now, their partner might be telling them that they do, but men are, can be stubborn too. But we've had to visit our dentist twice a year. So we visit our dentist regularly. And the dentist is in an ideal situation because already the dentist is looking into the mouth. The dentist can check for scalloping of the tongue, which can indicate that the tongue is pressing up against the teeth. Um, the dentist can check for a high palate. The dentist can check for mouth breathing. The dentist can check for trauma to the upper airways. The dentist can check for the size of the airway, but it's not happening. So why have dentists overlooked sleep? And there must be thousands of people who go into a dentist today and they're walking in one door they have obstructive sleep apnea. They're walking back out that same door and no attention has been brought to their sleep. Now, not all dentists, of course, I'm talking about the industry. Mm. 
I'm talking about the teaching profession. Um, but then, of course, we have dentists on the ground who know all of this. And luckily, there is a change happening. But it's going to take 20 years. Yeah, I was about to say, you know, it's probably down to education. And if they didn't get taught it in universities. They don't. The they don't get it taught in universities. Yeah. Like universities are not fit for purpose in terms of the curriculum needs to be changed. The curriculum needs to be more progressive. But then again, you have to ask, what is the caliber of the individuals in the teaching professions? You know, like, is it a situation that you go into a teaching profession and there's no impetus for you to grow? There's no impetus for you to be innovative. There's no impetus for you to, to be seeking, to be seeking new developments. Or do you just go into this teaching profession and you have your job now and happy days, do whatever you need to do and fulfill the minimum that you need to do to get paid and do it for 30, 40 years, get your pension and happy days. That shouldn't happen. Universities should be innovative and they should be out to seek the truth, but they're not. As you said. It seems that I'm giving out about everybody this morning, but I often have a rant on this because looking from the outside in i really wonder why has it been missed yeah well you know because you've had personal experiences of you know being a chronic asthma sufferer and you've experienced firsthand what is done to you and you've dedicated the rest of your life to it and you've seen you know thousands and thousands of people change their life for the better from doing the simple nasal breathing and I just can imagine the frustration. And as you said, you know, nobody makes money out of nasal breathing. So, you know, fingers crossed with the amazing ENTs you mentioned here in Australia and New Zealand, you know, and the thousand plus, plus, plus um, therapists that you're training, you know, it will get out there. And I'm keeping my fingers and toes crossed before 20 years because um <laughs> so, yeah so am i i'm beverly i just like to point out like there are, we have some wonderful instructors in australia mim Bime, and many others you know and they've been they've been putting this out there for for many many years and like it is wonderful it's happening it really is and this is one of the benefits of information and websites you know the spread of information now seems to be much much faster so it's so it's not all negative there's huge positives here and it's definitely moving in the right direction yeah well i'll do my best uh, and now you mentioned me by i actually contacted her recently and i'm doing one mm -hmm. of her workshops in a couple of weeks and fingers crossed a couple of my friends will come along as well and they're all super keen you know to spread the words because a lot of these questions about the pillows etc came from different friends and colleagues in various fields so i found since i've been back in australia that many people are willing to want to be in charge of their own health there's so many young people you know like young people with huge followings like um js health she's got over thirty thousand followers uh um, nutritionist, dietitian, and so many more. They want to make an impact and they're standing up for it. And I think it's amazing. And things like meditation and so forth, there's so many young people doing it. So yes. I'm, I'm yeah. really yeah. happy to be back here and see all these changes because I'm sure the young people were wider, you know, not putting up with it. They want to take charge of their own health. So maybe this is the revolution for good health that um, we've all been um, praying for in this industry. Yeah, it would be absolutely wonderful. You know, there's many changes on a societal level. Yeah. When we see the demise of institutionalized religion, when we see people questioning the education system, questioning the medical system, Young people are more free. They don't want to go into a job and stay there for 40 years in a job that they hate. Mm. So young people, because of education, it's given them the freedom to think. And I would totally agree with you. If this is driven by the next generations, this has got a future. And But also, 
the survival of the next generations is dependent yeah. on it. Absolutely, totally agree. Totally agree. And um, yeah, and as you mentioned in the last chat that um, your next book is about yoga for breathing exercises, yes. for yoga instructions. And I think that's going to be phenomenal because not only it's not all gentle, there's so many different styles of yoga. And a lot of them, when I was a gym junkie, I got into power yoga and absolutely loved it. When I was in Nice, France, there was a Bikram yoga studio dead opposite me. So I'd always be the last one running across the road. And um, so many different styles of um, yoga in France, you know, within a period of a year, they, the studios are just popping up, popping up, popping up. And over the last um, 10 years I've been there and in Monaco, there's studios absolutely everywhere. So I think- Yes, many styles of yoga, not to cut across you, Beverly, sorry. That's all right. But one anatomy. The human anatomy is the human anatomy. And it's yeah. very important for yoga instructors to understand breathing from an anatomical point of view and to understand it from three different dimensions. And I don't think it, it is at the moment, you know, um, the, the emphasis on yoga has been very much on the postures, but really the, one of the major arms of yoga is on breath. Mm. And let's get that aspect right. And it's let's get breathing off the mat. It's not just about how the individual is breathing in the yoga studio. And also while they're in their breathing in the yoga studio, bring them through the biochemistry, get them to feel air hunger, improve their blood circulation, improve oxygen delivery throughout the body. Don't have them in there just taking these full big breaths because you think it's good that they, the more air you breathe, the more oxygen being delivered. That's not true. You know, so I think it's, it's wonderful, like regardless of the modality and the different styles of yoga, there are breathing exercises, yes, to stress people, hyperventilation and breath holding. There are breathing exercises though to downregulate. There are breathing exercises to improve the biochemistry, the biomechanics. There are breathing exercises to influence the autonomic nervous system and stimulate the vagus nerve. And a yoga, a good yoga, sorry, a good yoga instructor will know their every posture that they have, and they will be able to tweak the breathing to each posture to influence that. When you have a student coming in, by the time of that session is over you will have brought that student through every single modality of breathing. And that's where it should be. And that's what we want to do with the oxygen advantage. You know, I had an idea of whatever it was 11 years ago or 10 years ago, we have a workshop, it's 10 or no, it's 11 exercises. And you bring people through it from exercise one right through to exercise 11. And by doing so, you're targeting every single modality of breathing but it could be done in yoga and it can be life-changing. And also for the yoga instructor to say, how I'm teaching you how to breathe inside the studio is not limited to the studio. This is how you should be breathing in your everyday life. This is how you should be breathing during physical exercise. This is how you should be breathing during sleep. And giving people the ability to understand that with the breath, you can change states. You know, if you're going into an exam, there is a way to change your breathing patterns. And it's also been shown in business that if you do two minutes of slow breathing, you've got better decision making. You know, if you're feeling lethargic and you want to upregulate, there's a way to do that. If you want to improve your breathing, if you want to get deeper sleep, if you breathe light for 15 minutes before sleep, if your nose is stuffy, what do you do? If you want to go for a run and optimize oxygen uptake, what do you do? How do you improve alveolar ventilation? If you're climbing a mountain, is there a way to breathe to improve gas exchange? And the answer to all of that is yes. And when you have those tools, as you mentioned earlier, these tools are for life. You know, I've, I've used them in my personal continuously. Even before we had a chat, I was, went for a 5K jog and it was nose breathing and breath holding. And that's what I do. And nose low and slow breathing. And, you know, you make it part of your life and then you don't have to think about it, but you'll always get the benefits. Fantastic. Well, I've been doing a lot of your tips and I've got a heart post-it by my door saying pinch my nose. So every time <laughs> I walk out, I do my nose holes just to make it a habit. And a lot of people on my meditation weekly groups uh, have been practicing and they've all listened to the um, 
exercises you gave last time, and a few of them have contacted me to say, when they do the um, air hunger ones, try to practice for three or four minutes. Sometimes after seven to 10 breaths, they need to take a longer breath, but they make sure it's slow breath out and then they continue. So they asked me, mm. um, was that okay? And I said, I'm sure. Yeah, of is. course. Yeah. Of course. If, if, you, if you're doing the breathe light exercise and you're really taking a soft breath in through your nose and a really relaxed and a slow, gentle breath out, and you're reducing the volume of air that you're breathing in, if you get a little bit stressed or if you have involuntary movement of the diaphragm, take a rest. So take that fuller breath and take even two or three of them and then go back to it. So it's a balance. You know, this is really a tricky exercise, but it's a wonderful exercise. And it's a wonderful exercise because you're deliberately creating a little bit of discomfort in the body and you're surrendering to the discomfort. But the air hunger is also signifying that carbon dioxide is increasing in the blood. And this stimulates the vagus nerve. So for many people, they will have increased water saliva in the mouth, that your body is prepared for the digestion of food. You've activated the rest and digest response. But also they get sleepy. So they are down regulating. And also you're increasing blood flow and oxygen delivery to the brain. You'll not, and throughout the body, you'll notice that your hands get warmer for many people. And you're also reducing the body's chemosensitivity to carbon dioxide buildup. So it's a very simple exercise, but it's a very wonderful exercise. And yeah, it can be a little bit tricky. You have air hunger, the air hunger gets too much. Just take a rest and go back to it. And I think this was one of the, the pivotal moments of when I came across it, because when I practiced doing that exercise, I felt the temperature increase in my fingers and I knew I was onto something. And this is where... People say to me, you know, well, I've been doing this breathing exercise for 10 years. Well, and I said, that's fine. Do this exercise for two weeks and see if it brings you more benefits than the previous 10 years doing your previous exercise. And that's the best way to find out. If it works, it works. And if it doesn't, you don't feel that in from it. Yeah, you probably can't remember, but I did say about my cold hands and feet. So I've been practicing those. And it's funny, I noticed... At different times of the day, I can do it more easier than other times and depending on my mood and things like that. But my hands have definitely got a lot warmer. So I'm very grateful to you for that. Good stuff. Thank you. And on that note, I'd like to say thank you very, very much, as always, um, for coming on the show. And I'll put your links like the last time and I know there's be lots of ladies both in France, Monaco and Australia who are waiting keenly to hear this chat so thank you very much pleasure, thanks very much Beverly your, your first question in terms of infants at what age do they switch from, from nose to mouth breathing Anatomically, when we are born, we cannot physically breathe through the mouth. And I'm not sure if this is for 100% of infants, there may be some exceptions, but the soft palate, which is basically the soft tissue at the back of the roof of the mouth, that meets with the epiglottis. So the flap um, that's in the airway. And as a result, physically, the mouth for a young infant is only for eating and for maybe, you know, communicating, et cetera, drinking. The nose for the infant is only for breathing. Now, in, in, infants, though, who have an anatomically deficient nose, they often struggle. And unfortunately, it's implicated in sudden infant death syndrome. Because if their nasal airway is not sufficiently large enough to allow for easy breathing, the children cannot switch to mouth breathing because anatomically they're not able to and they can die as a result of hypoxia in sleep. And this could be recognized in the, first couple of, in the first couple of days of life. 